the platonic metaphor of the charioteer was that there were two processes in the brain that are kind of competing for control and that determine behavior. Plato called them reason and appetite. And appetites, many people would say, are in what's called the limbic system, or kind of the older part of the brain. Those are, you know, I really want a cheeseburger now. Um, I, I, I really need these shoes, and I can spend them, buy them for free with my credit card and so forth. But the front of the brain sort of interprets them, and in some cases overrides them if the feelings are things that lead you to crave immediate reward that's bad for you in the long run, then the, the cortex's job is to sort of rein in. But when people are in sort of close proximity to something that they really want, that may shut down their cognitive functions. We had people play a game of chance. And if you pick a winning card, you get all the chocolate chip cookies you can eat. If you lose, you have to stay an extra 30 minutes in the laboratory. Some people played the game, and we simply told them about the cookies. Other people, when they came to the lab, we had a toaster oven and the chocolate chip cookies were baking in the laboratory. And the whole room was filled with the aroma of chocolate chip cookies. And what we found was that people were about twice as likely to play the game if they could smell the cookies than if they couldn't. We call this motivational myopia. So that when you're in close proximity to things that you really want, you tend to sort of become myopic. You tend to be short-sighted. So like the platonic metaphor, the charioteer has to sort of keep these two horses both doing their jobs and pulling the chariot. When we talk about motivation, we're talking about these basic biological needs first. The need for food and water and sex. Hunger, thirst, salt appetite, seeking of, you know, avoidance of change in body temperature, which animals do. They're the base of the tree. They're the subjective elements of these instinctive patterns. Professor Derek Denton's research on sheep demonstrated changes in behavior when the animals were deprived of salt. When animals become deficient of it, as we were able to easily contrive with this experimental model, they became uh, very disturbed and restless. And, you know, they would kick the side of their cages and stamp their feet and so on. Of course, their blood pressure went up when there was a question of salt. Their cardiac rate went up, their respiration rate went up, or their rate of dripping went up, and so on. So they were very excited animals at the prospect of gratifying the particular motivation. A number of these instinctive mechanisms have fast gratification processes. The capacity of an animal, when desiccated, to go into a water hole and drink in a couple of minutes and get out rather than sit there and be a target to a predator. has high survival value. I mean, impulses from the mouth, from the tongue, from the pharynx and the esophagus, metering the volume swallowed, from the stomach, dealing with the distension of the stomach as the material gets into it. All those things feed up to the brain and in some way turn the system off. It's turned off long before the water drunk could be absorbed from the gut into the bloodstream. These desperate needs of the body cause radical changes in brain activity. Such is the case when the brain is deprived of oxygen. What we did was increase the carbon dioxide content of the blood uh, going to the brain, which you can do with a face mask or a mouthpiece or whatever. And the effect is quite dramatic. And from a neuroimaging point of view, you know, the brain really catches far. You get uh, great excitability. Hypothalamus in the, the cerebellum, uh, anterior parts of the pond, and so forth. The frontal areas of the brain and the cingulate and so on deactivate because if you're in the situation of having hunger for air and you feel you're going to die, you don't really need your higher cognitive processes of the frontal lobe, and they conspicuously deactivate. As demonstrated in the cookie experiment, our cognitive processes are often no match for our appetites, especially given an abundance of food. In our environment, we are presented with so much food, tasty food available, that it's very easy to eat too much. And it seems that genetically, we have evolved to select tasty foods, which often are ones that are high in fat, and the mechanisms to turn off our eating behavior 
don't seem to exist except at the extreme. So uh, what they find is that in order for a full stomach to turn off eating behavior, it has to be overstuffed by a third extra calories than a normal meal. So it really works for animals in the wild who make a killing and need to kind of overeat and store those calories for a time when they will be going without food. We almost have to be more conscious in the control of our eating behavior if it goes on automatic pilot, for most of us, we'll probably overeat. Another factor complicating our ability to eat appropriately is that our culture puts forth, especially for women, but for certain categories of men, this image to be very thin. And that has caused nearly everyone almost to engage in dieting. When people diet, it creates a tremendous craving that is very hard to dampen. And so when motivation to diet is less, when food is in sight, individuals will scarf down whatever is present. And uh, sometimes it takes the form of binge eating where a person can eat a whole day's worth of calories in a single sitting in 15 minutes. While research on eating disorders has yet to discover all the genetic and biological factors involved, most agree that the pressures to be thin can sometimes derail homeostatic processes. Anorexia nervosa is, if you reduce it to its simplest properties, the, the, the common denominator, it's a, a fear of normal or mature body weight and shape. That fear sustains the avoidance of caloric intake, and it produces a wide range of symptoms of abnormal feeding behavior, deviant attitudes about weight and shape, and distortions in the way the body is perceived. In bulimia nervosa, weight tends to remain within normal limits, but the attitude towards weight and shape is still markedly distorted. So there is a repetitive pattern of overeating or gorging, followed by some means of eliminating food that is ingested, usually self-induced vomiting. Other complications involve laxative or diuretic abuse, which can be quite extreme. Um, I've been bulimic for four years, um, on and off, carbohydrates and breads and that kind of thing. That's what I would restrict normally. So when I was going to just eat whatever I wanted, that's what I would do because I knew it wouldn't matter. You throw up 15, 20 times and then you repeat that session eight times a day. So my 24-hour day was consistently based upon that. In young adults who develop bulimia, there tends to be sometimes too much expression of emotion. They may be more likely to get involved with alcohol, for example, or for there to be a lot more anger expression in the family. I mean, I would be yelling and screaming and saying things, and I would look at myself afterwards and just not have any idea where they came from and feel horrible. It's all about what I thought of myself, and I was never happy enough with myself. It's caught up a lot with body image. We used to think it was curves, and we were proud to get curves. But today, it's all about being lean. And, uh, and so girls see this pet fat coming on their bodies, and some of them have trouble accepting that. They panic. They start dieting. They learn that they can control. They can lose weight. As our enjoyment of food is nature's way of ensuring we'll nourish our bodies, the pleasure of sex helps ensure the survival of our genes. Men and women both possess a strong motivation to be sexually desirable. The biological urge for sex, however, differs from other motives, such as thirst and hunger. It's a little bit different in so far as it's fluctuant. Sex is not quite a deficiency. It's something which is organized by hormonal changes and a large amount of programming in the brain in relation to recognition of the desired partner, characteristically the opposite sex, but not necessarily invariably, and so that you've got undoubtedly a large amount of hardwired neural organization, but primed by endocrine. 
Sex kicks in strongly as a motivator during adolescence, and that's when many kids start masturbating, uh, thinking a lot about sex, and um, not being content anymore just to play with their same-sex peers, uh, but also to want to interact with the other sex. There are some average differences between what men and women want. Men tend to look for younger women. Well, women actually have a preference for slightly older men. Women are less focused than men on looks and instead tend to emphasize things like status, education, resources. Women are looking for a stable guy, on average, somebody who would be a good father, good husband, good provider. Everybody wants their mate to be faithful, uh, but whereas uh, men are a little more focused on the sexual fidelity, women are more focused on the emotional fidelity. They want a guy who's going to love them and only them. Women have a very different response pattern. Straight men get aroused to sexual stimuli depicting women. Gay men get aroused to sexual stimuli depicting men. Both heterosexual women and homosexual women, on average, respond uh, at least physiologically or genitally to both kinds of stimuli. That is, women seem to have bisexual arousal pattern. Even if you ask women, what they're feeling. Uh, straight women will often say that they're more aroused to watching two women than two men. Gay men learn that they're turned on by men and not by women. But for women, something else is going on, and we're in the early stages of investigating this. The other large gender difference we found was in attitudes about casual sex. Boys and men are considerably more approving of casual sex, that is sex in an uncommitted kind of relationship, a one night stand. Gay men in this variable are just like straight men in terms of their interest. And gay men are actually able to accomplish a lot more casual sex than straight men. Why? Well, it's because the people who they want to have casual sex with are also interested in it. What factors determine sexual orientation? Is it a matter of choice? I can't tell you that there's uniform agreement in the field, but I personally am more and more convinced that sexual orientation is primarily inborn, particularly in males. Simon LaVey, for example, found a little part of the hypothalamus in the center of the brain, a cluster of nerve cells that is larger in heterosexual men than it is in women and homosexual men. Now, that was a very controversial finding because people thought, well, maybe the difference between gay and straight men was the result of their sexual behaviors. But subsequently, that same difference has now been found between male sheep that are attracted to ewes and those that are attracted to other rams. About 8% of sheep share a same-sex sexual orientation. They exhibit the same brain difference as do human heterosexual versus homosexual males. So more and more, it's looking like sexual orientation is not a choice. Your sexual orientation cannot be completely genetic, because if it were, then the identical twin uh, similarity rate should be 100%, not 50%. So there are clearly environmental causes of sexual orientation as well. And the patterns were consistent with some important genetic influence. Now, one thing I want to clarify here is that I just said that environment must matter for sexual orientation, but that's not the same thing as saying that the social environment must matter. There's a biological environment as well, and the biological environment could be what's most important for sexual orientation, particularly Today in America, there's tremendous diversity in the experience of gay and lesbian people. I think most would say that it was toughest growing up and coming to the realization of being different, and particularly those people who were in families or environments where they, could, they realized that that was not acceptable and it was going to be a problem if they were homosexual. 
and coming out later and then immersing themselves in the gay or lesbian communities, I think that is a time in which most of them feel more accepted. The need for acceptance, the need to bond with friends and family. We all possess a built-in motivation to belong. This need, hardwired by biology, is not unique to humans. Somebody did an experiment in which they put uh, one group of sheep, a flock of them, in one paddock, and in the next paddock they put two sheep. And those sheep went up and down the fence all the time, and they, you know, obviously wanted to join the others. And then they added another sheep, and there were three sheep, and they added another sheep, four sheep. Then they went over the thing, over the paddock. So in other words, there was a, a, a gregarious element. Many species show it. It's obviously come out the appreciation of the gregarious nature of the human species. People can't survive and thrive now or in any of our history without other people. And in ancestral times, as the evolutionary psychologists like to say, it was a death sentence to be banished from the group. If you were sent off into the jungle or the savanna by yourself, you were dead, basically. And so it, it stands to reason that people would have a very strong motivation to be attached to other people and to uh, be accepted by other people. My name is Alfred Nunes. I got arrested and I went to prison. And here I am. Um, I got married in 98 to my wife, Donna. The hardest part is being away from my family. I went to see him a few times before they transferred him out, out to San Quentin. Separated by glass, and you have to talk through a phone. Can't touch. Last year we had a baby, and he was born while I was in prison. So that changed everything. That changed it all. That changed the way I look at everything. Go back tens of thousands of years in conditions of privation. If you procreate, but do not form connections, do not care give, your genes don't make it into the gene pool because that infant doesn't survive to a level ready for reproduction themselves. Maybe my boy and uh, this being away from my family will be what it takes for me to change and not ever have to come back to one of these places because I don't want to come back. <laughs> How you doing? So I'm trying to do everything I can to be one of those 2% so I don't end up being back here again. Can you look at that, huh? Can you say that, uh, yeah? Where do we find the motivation to change? How do we rally the will and determination to achieve at sports, in school, and at work? Most of our motivation is really cognitively based. Namely, we motivate ourselves by our goals and aspirations by the outcomes that we expect our actions to uh, produce and by um, the kind of attributions we make for our uh, successes and failures. The prefrontal cortex has been implicated in goal-directed behavior, in particular in the region of the left prefrontal cortex. So when we are um, trying to achieve a, a pleasurable goal or, or a positive state, um, the prefrontal cortex, the left prefrontal cortex, help basically maintaining the representation of this goal toward the achievement uh, of this um, outcome. And once we commit ourselves to certain goals, then we're motivated by the satisfaction of achieving them and the discontent with, with uh, falling short. Organizational psychologists at the Gallup organization and elsewhere have been studying what they call employee engagement. And so they're interested in finding what kind of management style and what kind of work environment engages employees. Researchers have found that those who report the most job satisfaction are those who are intrinsically motivated. People vary an awful lot in terms of how important the external rewards are versus internal. People who are intrinsically motivated are more interested in doing what they're doing because they like to do it. They enjoy feeling a sense of accomplishment. Uh, they feel very good about, let's say, helping people or developing something new, things like that. People are extremely motivated and look always for what am I getting out of this. Central to Csikszentmihalyi's research is the concept of flow. 
All of us have had those moments called flow, where things are going so well, time doesn't matter, you forget to eat, forget to go to the bathroom, you could just keep, somebody else would get your attention, this is going so good, we go forever. Those are magical moments. I remember our sons when they started reading and began to get immersed in a good book. They would get really angry if we told that it's time to come to eat, even though they were hungry or whatever, you know. So that immersion goes all the way to a rock climber hanging 3,000 feet or a surgeon uh, doing an operation. That, that feeling is what motivates people to just keep going back again and again. These magical moments that fully engage a person's skills correlate positively with happiness, higher self-esteem, and seem to occur when people are intrinsically motivated. We took some children who were very intrinsically motivated, who had flow very often, high school students, and another group of students who almost never had experienced flow during every day, normal week, and we had them do a task where you had a computer with questions, you had to respond very quickly. And it turned out that the ones who were extrinsically motivated, or those who didn't have flow experiences, spent more time solving these problems. They made more mistakes, but the biggest difference was that they really didn't enjoy this at all. This seems to hint that encouraging flow experiences can help with productivity in the workplace and enhance learning in schools. Usually you get this experience when you set your goals and you get the feedback immediately from how well you're doing. Well, in school, most kids don't have any, any hand in uh, setting goals, and the feedback is usually very slow. I mean, you turn in a paper, three, four days later, you get it back. I just came back this year from Sweden, from Denmark, where they have entire schools transformed into flow schools. So they have the children set goals at all levels, day by day, week by week, uh, sometimes hour by hour, and they get immediate feedback by, from the teacher or from the way they prepare the situation so that the ch child can see the feedback and doesn't need to be told. That kind of learning is much more interesting to students. It's, it's something they, they learn to learn, first of all, and then they learn to enjoy learning, and they learn something that is quite substantive. And in every study I ever seen, the kids who are purely extrinsically motivated get less good grades, they grow up being less happy later on. The people who are more intrinsically motivated uh, tend to go through life and enjoy their work, enjoy family, relations, the weather, whatever. If you expect that you will become happy because of what you achieve outside, with what people give you uh, as rewards, they're not going to be happy. You have to learn how to live in a way that you feel rewarded by everything you do. Too much emphasis on material rewards does produce a kind of a jadedness and a, more than a, it, it's just that you're not feeling that you're doing anything unless you get the end product, which may take a whole month if you have a monthly check. Your well-being then becomes tied more and more to this kind of external source of reward. Of course, pay does make some difference, but many business leaders overestimate the importance of pay because there's other things there. People having good friends in the workplace, feeling respected by their supervisors, getting clear feedback about their job and what they're supposed to be doing and how to improve and when they're doing well at their job, getting a lot of positive feedback at work. All of these things overshadow pay in terms of the importance and 
predicting whether work is satisfying. And so we know some of the things now that can make a workplace a better workplace. Managers that empower their employees, that give them some degree of control over their own work environment, tend to have more engaged employees. Here in West Michigan, we have large companies that supply parts to the auto industry and that manufacture office furniture. And they have been renowned for their employee engagement policies, for giving workers power to participate in the decisions about how the workplace is going to be organized, how the line is going to operate. And sometimes giving the workers a stake in the company by sharing profits or even uh, stock options with workers that help invest them so they feel a sense of ownership for the organization that they're a part of. It used to be where the leader was sort of the decision maker, plotted out the course of action, expected followers to follow. And more and more today, followers are contributing. There's a mutual trust there. That the follower trusts the leader, and the leader empowers the followers and trusts that the followers will do the right thing, will get the job done. And so it's not top-down authority anymore, it's really shared authority. Finding motivation from within even in our personal lives, undoubtedly brings greater satisfaction to our successes. Whatever other factors are.